Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Molly McGuire. I am the Digital Strategies Librarian at Oakland University Libraries. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our third panel, Institutional Impact of Personal Legacies and Loss. We're here just before 1 p.m. Eastern Time, which is 10 a.m. Pacific Time. You can follow the um, conversation on social media using the hashtag LostLam, L-A-M. I'll be introducing our speakers, our three speakers, and then we'll have time at the end for a question and answer portion. Um, so please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A um, as the panel is going on. So our first speaker is Laura Gray Blair, who is a final year PhD candidate at Queen Mary University of London and research engagement manager for the UK Science Museum's National Collection Center. She is completing a Wellcome Trust funded project examining early, early bibliograph bibliotherapeutic th processes in 19th century lunatic asylums. Her research interests lie primarily in the history of books and reading with a focus on the use and development of library collections. The title of her talk is Rescue These Treasures, The Politics of 20th Century Dispersal and Acquisition of English Country House Libraries. So Laura, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Looks good. Excellent. Okay, um, thank you very much everybody um, for coming to listen to me today. Um, I also have to thank uh, the British Library and the National Trust for funding and supporting the Collaborative Doctoral Fellowship, which made this research possible. Um, and my supervisors, Lucy Evans and Tim Pai for further supporting my research in this field. So the early 20th century in Britain saw high levels of estate tax, two world wars, and economic depression uh, impact the finances of the families who owned significant estates. It is due in large part to these circumstances that Britain has lost huge numbers of historic houses, but political and legal changes also allowed the preservation of many estates. The National Trust was founded in 1895, and its primary goal was to promote the permanent preservation for the benefit of the nation of lands and tenements, including buildings of beauty or historic interest. Schemes such as the Country House Library Scheme, the Country House Scheme, initiated in the early 20th century, allowed families to give their houses and estates in order to avoid taxes which would otherwise bankrupt them. During my research fellowship, I studied the libraries of four treasure house properties now cared for by the National Trust. These were Blickling Hall, Ham House, Deerham Park, and Cuddleston Hall. The pressures which led owners to transfer responsibility for their properties to the trust also tended to have had an earlier impact on their collections of art, furniture, and books. In an attempt to stave off the loss of entire estates, families often looked to raise money through auctioning off their belongings. And libraries were a very common victim of this pragmatism, often first to face the auctioneer's hammer. In country houses um, li where libraries might form a primarily visual appeal, their value compared with great art or furniture might be lesser. And for those families with serious bibliophiles, val valuable volumes could raise significant sums with only a few empty shelf inches. The sale of collections prior to National Trust acquisition can present a really serious challenge in researching, understanding, interpreting, and presenting a property's history. The trust has made efforts to bring back objects connected to the properties, though this can take decades, and many items haven't and probably never will return. Understanding the gaps in the historic collections, especially where the gaps themselves are unclear, can help shed light on the lives of these houses and their occupants. This kind of study also provides insight into the book trade, into the conversations happening about treasures and their relationship perceived or actual to British culture, and also into the institutions which developed with the aim of retaining items of national importance. In general, library sales of this period represent some of the most significant opportunities for collectors, institutional or individual, to acquire books and manuscripts, which in many 
uh, cases had been in private ownership for centuries. At the same time, institutions such as the British Museum, now the British Library, faced significant difficulty in raising the funds for the acquisition of material, especially competing in a rare books market that was dominated by much wealthier American collectors. This resulted in some of the um, most great losses to British book heritage and some of the most significant gains for American institutions. Conversations in the press at the time uh, about the loss of items deemed, quote, peculiarly English, revolved around protecting collections from what were painted as predatory American collectors. But the relationship between Britain and America in the realm of the library cell was often much more complicated than this. The libraries at Blickling, Ham, Durham and Cuddleston were not just static collections. Few libraries are. Some had faced much earlier library dispersals, such as the sale of John Maitland's books at Ham in the 17th century, also due to financial difficulties. All four, however, faced major or complete dispersal onto the open market in the 20th century, often spelling the beginning of the end for the estate's private ownership. I'm going to talk about three of these houses today and the significance um, that their sales have for the story of heritage preservation in Britain. In the late 1920s, high profile sales boosted the conversation about treasures in Britain. The Latrell Psalter, an extravagantly illustrated 14th century English manuscript, had been on long term loan to the British Museum, but had been put up for sale in Sotheby at Sotheby's in 1929 um, by Herbert Wells Blundell, heir to Lulworth Castle. Blundell referenced tax burdens in letters to museum staff arguing that, quote, in these days, no one can say he owns anything in the face of the death duties that are expressly devised to break up and confiscate settled estates. Junius Parnell Gilson, keeper of manuscripts, appealed to Wells to give the National Library the opportunity of purchasing, given the importance of the Psalter to British history. The negotiations which took place surrounding the Psalter and also the Bedford Book of Hours give some good indication of the collaboration that was actually ongoing beyond, between the British Museum, booksellers, and even American collectors who were more, more usually considered antagonists when it came to the rare books market. Rosenbach, often nicknamed Terror of the Auction Room, had been alerted to the sale of the Luttrell Psalter but did not attempt to purchase it. Banker John Pierpoint Morgan Jr. also resisted the temptation to acquire the item and instead provided the British Museum an interest-free loan of £31,500, which enabled the purchase. If the museum did not raise the money within a year, the Salter would instead go to the Pierre Morgan collection. The money was raised from the museum's reserves, a special grant from the British government, the National Art Collections Fund, and also hundreds of donations from the public, an act of, quote, self-denying liberality, which was praised in the British Museum quarterly. The museum's journal. This highlights the difficulties that British institutions were having in securing items considered of national importance. The year before in 1931, the Friends of the National Libraries had been founded specifically in relation to sales such as these. Lord Macmillan had declared that, quote, there was no time when the libraries of this country had stood more in need of friends than now, when the financial needs of the possessors of valuable books and manuscripts were becoming more and more stringent, and the likelihood of losing works such greater. Since 1931, the British Library has received over 400 grants from this organisation. And our um, earlier friend and competitor, Pierpont Morgan, uh, became one of the society's first major benefactors. The acquisition of the Luttrell and Bedford items was key, but the purchase seriously taxed the museum's resources. When 1932 rolled round and the sale of the library at Blickling Hall was publicised, there were serious concerns on both sides of the pond. Philip Kerr, the 11th Marquess, had to raise funds in order to cover, to cover his estate duties and looked to the library to do so. It was reported that Lord Lothian felt that he would achieve better prices in the US than in Britain, and a writer for the Scotsman felt that the London books market was somewhat perturbed at the sale taking place in America. The library was to be sold in New York, and rare books expert Philip Brooks later described 1932 as, quote, the year of the invasion of England by the American Art Anderson Galleries. The Friends of the National Libraries had barely been operating a year, 
for the Yorkshire Evening Post called on this organisation specifically to rescue these treasures. I.A. Williams, writing for the same paper, described these items as things so peculiarly English that it would seem a misfortune, almost an offence, if their final resting place was to be outside England. The minutes of the British Museum Standing Committee for the 12th of December 1931 note that Mr Bell had been granted leave to, to bid on the Blickling homilies from the Reserve Fund. It was described as an important specimen of English prose. Interestingly, it was Rosenbach, the terror of the auction room, who was to act on behalf of the British Museum, and the trustee noted thanks for his offer to bid without permission and, if possible, to obtain financial assistance. Unfortunately, the auction prices proved far beyond what the museum could afford. Shane Leslie, a friend of Rosenbach, described the sale of the Blickling treasures as, quote, a real loss to English literary collections, with the Tickhill or Ticket Salter and the Blickling homilies singled out as items which should not have left the country. Rosenbach purchased the Ticket Salter for $61,000, and the Blickling homilies, which had set aside uh, that the British Museum had set aside 200 guineas for, about £2,100, sold to Barnett J. Bayer for $55,000. The whereabouts of many of the Blickling uh, books are unknown, but several important items have been traced. The Blickling homilies, for example, are today in the collection at the Princeton University Library, and the ticket sold to is held by the New York Public Library, having been sold on by Rosenbach very shortly afterwards. The story at Blickling isn't a simple one of loss, however. Many other items from Blickling, whilst initially entering into private collections, have ended up in public institutions in the UK and the US, where they are appreciated by the public and accessible to researchers. The money raised through the sale of such key items also prevented further depletion of the library, and the Blickling collection remains one of the most significant libraries in terms of scope and rarity in the care of the National Trust. Lord Lothian's inheritance of Blickling and the subsequent management of the property and taxes via the sales was to be influential in the development of National Trust policy toward country houses during the 1930s and 40s. Mark Purcell notes that Lord Lothian's authorised biography, quote, laid heavy stress on his distress, distress at the sales, his original intention to present the Blickling homilies to the British Museum, and his relief at the high prices which the books made in New York. Lord Lothian addressed the annual general meeting of the National Trust two years after the library sale, entreating the trust to find ways of preserving the estates and collections of families who could no longer afford to maintain them. Lothian's module of ownership was new. On his death, he left Blickling and the entire estate to the National Trust. It wasn't without complications, but it also set a precedent going forward. Ham House provides a contrasting example to Blickling, both in terms of the family approach to the sale of the library and the methods used to acquire books from the National Collection. The 1938 sale and later 1947 sale entirely depleted Ham House of its library. Earlier sales had also decimated the collections. Ham's library has a long history of active collection and active destruction, as significant collections were built and lost several times since the 17th century. As opposed to Blickling, where a large collection remains intact, this complete looking library on the shelves at Ham today is in reality a testament to the destruction of the Country House Library during the 20th century. It's the collection of Norman Norris, a 20th century book collector who amassed his collection by picking through the spoils of other Country House libraries on sale across Britain during and after the Second World War. This library needs a book all of its own. When a large portion of the library was sold in 1938, the British Museum was again in a difficult financial position. It had in 1937 pub purchased for £66,000 or about £4.7 million pounds in today's money, uh, the Ashley Library from the widow of collector Thomas James Wise, who's now known to be quite the forger. W.A. Marsden, keeper of printed books, saw an opportunity with the Ham sale, however, and he picked out three books, which in particular he felt should, quote, not be allowed to, lost to, to be lost to the National Library and probably to the country if means can be found to save them. These were the Book of Diverse Ghostly Matters printed by Caxton in 1491 and possibly one of his last works. It would complete an incomplete copy that the museum already owned. The Pastime of Pleasure written by Tudor poet Stephen Hawes 
and printed by Wink and Word in 1509. It was imperfect, but it was the only copy of the first edition of the poem in existence. The third book was The Comfort of Lovers, also by Hawes and also printed by Wink and Word, but in 1511. It was the only copy of the poem known and the sole authority for the text, as no reprint existed. Marsden admitted that even under normal circumstances, the purchase of these books would, quote, overtax the resources of the departmental grant without additional support from the general reserve, which was also depleted. Direct purchase was out of the question and the sum required far too large to appeal uh, to the friends of the national libraries who might have otherwise helped. Instead, Marsden had to work to find an alternative means of acquisition. For some time, the museum had been in contact with Carl H. Forsheimer, a banker and one of the founders of the American Stock Exchange, who also collected rare books. He'd been trying to buy one of the museum's copies of the first edition of Bacon's Essays, published in 1507. He'd suggested in 1935 that one of these might be exchanged for its monetary equivalent in books. The museum had not entertained the idea at all, but with the prospect of losing the capstan and the words to foreign, private, um, foreign and or private buyers, Marsden revisited this proposal. It was then agreed that Forsheimer would lodge 2,000 pounds with Rosenbach, who would then release the money after receiving the bacon. It worked. Quaridge secured the three desired items for a price of 12, 1,260 pounds, including commission, and the money left over was used to purchase yet another ham item, the overthrow of the gout by Dr. Christopher Belista, printed in 1577. Thanks to some cre creativity on Marsden's part, all four of these books are still in the British Library's collection. The poor books of Durham Park, however, faced a very different fate across the 20th century. The home of colonial win administrator William Blathwaite, Durham was home to a considerable working library almost none of which was retained at the property now in the Tufts Square. It was instead Blaithwaite's um, colonial papers which received considerable interest at various sales from 1910 through to 1970. In 1910, a selection of these papers relating to North America produced a serious rivalry. The Western Daily Press noted that it was, quote, known beforehand that American collectors would pour out money like water to obtain possessions of these literary treasures. British book dealer Frank T. Sabin paid £8,650, reported the highest price ever paid for a single lot at Sotheby's for either a manuscript or a printed book, and the highest amount ever paid at any auction for any collection of historical documents at the time. The press did make comment. A writer for the Evening Mail suggested it was a matter of regret that these documents are not now in the record office or the British Museum, seeing that they are all of very high historic and social importance in the history of Great Britain over the seas. The books and manuscripts of the collection were also seriously depleted through multiple sales. Anna Simone notes in that 1731, the catalogue contained 2000 titles, whereas the library in 1983 at Durham was not more than a quarter of this, this number. The British Museum shown to, seems to have shown little interest in any of these sales, and they don't feature in any correspondence or reports for keepers. Incunables and early printed books in 1912 sparked no concern. Manuscripts in 1955 were unremarked upon. And despite a healthier reserve fund later in the 1950s, books from Chatsworth House were prioritized and the 17th and 18th century English books sold from Durham in 1958 received no mention. The whereabouts of the books known to be at Durham in 1731 are unclear and the Blathwaite papers are spread throughout private and institutional libraries across the world. Only a hint of interest in recovering Durham items is visible. The Blathwaite name pops up in 20th century sales catalogues when items returned, uh, dispersed in the 19th century returned to the market. Every so often, the gaps in our knowledge though can be filled by serendipity or design. Two instances of this occurred during my research for this project. The first was fleeting. During the fellowship, one of the books sold at Blickling in 1932 entered the open market again for sale with Quaritch at the New York International Antiquarian Book Fair 2022. The copy of Carmina printed in Venice in 1475 had belonged to a Dutch soldier and scholar and contains his ownership inscription. 
The catalogue for 2022 suggests that this was part of the Ellis Library, which was the founding library um, of Blickling. It was bought by Barnett J. Bayer for Thomas F. Woods and was sold by his descendants. It was priced at $55,000. Sadly, the resources of institutions such as the National Trust and the British Library are about as stretched as they were nearly a century ago. And we won't be able to acquire this book for Blickling quite yet. Other books, though, have made it back onto the shelves. The published journal of Edward Cecil ended up back on the shelves at Blickling, having been repurchased at some point decades, decades ago. It was sold in the 1932 sale to an unknown buyer for £350. Second was Strabo's Geographia, printed in Rome in 1473, um, at the press of Arnold Penartz and Conrad Swainholm, the first in the city. It was repurchased in 1990 with the help of a grant from the Friends of the National Libraries, who provided £2,500 of the £16,500 required. It had been sold in Blickling uh, in, 1930, in New York in 1932, and the Brick Row Bookshop had purchased it for £425. And uh, unfortunately, though, its owners in the intervening 58 years are unknown until more provenance work can be carried out. Finally, um, I've been reunited with some of the books of Dirham through my other role as a rare books cataloger. Until recently, the books on uh, display at Dirham had almost all been what the trust refer to as shelf fillers, there to fill out the shelves that visitors could see through the open door of the library. However, last year, the trust were able to arrange the purchase of over 800 volumes from the descendants of the family who lived at Dirham. I'm now in the process of cataloguing these books and have already come across indications that these books were held in the Durham Library in the 17th and 18th centuries. We have a shelf list, but not much more. Once I have these catalogues, I'll be able to uh, compare them to my records of the 20th century sales and determine whether any of these newly acquired items were involved. Um, so get back to me in about five years time. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I hope you've enjoyed my paper today. Um, I look forward to any questions that you might have. Um, and I'm always interested in talking about books via email. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Um, our, our next presenter is Lauren S. Turner, who describes herself as the family historian her family never wanted. She works at the University of Denver as the digital archivist. And the title of her talk is Omissions and Obituaries, Reckoning with Loss and Tracing Family Histories. Lauren, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Molly. Um, I hope you can see this. <clears throat> Looks good. All right, awesome. Um, thank you everyone for being here with me today. Um, let's get started. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am coming from you, coming to you today from my office at the University of Denver, which resides on the land of Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations. The founding of my institution is implicated in the historic settler violence against those nations and the work that I do as digital archivist and residency librarian is rooted in white supremacy, colonial wrongdoings, and false ownership. The journey to trace my family history has led me back to those same issues of ownership, specifically pertaining to the Choctaw and Chickasaw tribes of Oklahoma. What is shown here is a small collection of the digitized items my, that document my ancestors' adoption into citizenship as Choctaw freedmen. Um, the, also displays the allotment and purchase of land, and it's just one example of the negotiations required to maintain ownership in what seems to be an optimistic story. So this is me, uh, Lauren Turner, again, my name um, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am described as an African-American woman with light brown skin, glasses, uh, short, curly, dark hair. And today I'm wearing a white sweater and my grandmother's pearls. This is a photo of me from Montenegro this summer. 
Currently, I am the digital archivist and residency librarian at the University of Denver, and I have come to librarianship as a third career behind magazine journalism and nonprofit marketing. I grew up here in Denver, and I'm the eldest of two daughters raised by strict educator parents. My mother relied heavily on her Catholic faith and my father on his football coach one-liners as they tried to steer me toward becoming this version of myself. The particular one-liner that has traveled through space and time with me has always been the same. It was said to me every time I left the house, and often I knew it was coming, but I didn't always know the appropriate response. My dad would say, remember who you are. So, as you can imagine, I have spent a lot of time thinking about who I am. Surprisingly, when it came time to ask those same questions of my parents, my grandparents, and even my great grandparents, in an attempt to supplement my understanding of our place in the world, it seemed that no one could exactly remember who they were, or at least they didn't really want to tell me. What started as a series of questions aimed at my paternal great grandmother, who I only knew then as honey, has developed into an obsession, bleeding over into my friendships and ultimately my work. Back in 2017, when I asked Honey about her childhood and who we came from, she quickly showed me where my father got his ability to spit out one liners that stung. She said, I better not read about this in some book or magazine. So instead, I'm here giving this presentation today. In October of 2022, I attended the Digital Library Federation Conference in Baltimore, Maryland. Two days after returning home to Denver, my maternal grandmother passed away. She was 95 years old, the mother of seven, two of whom she had already lost. Uh, she lived in an assisted living facility and she had been a widow for the past 30 years. Her passing was not unexpected, but like the loss of most people, it has come with this continued relearning of how to live without her. In the moments preceding her death, I was swept away with so much that um, my, my emotions really took a complete backseat. Now, plans were being made at this point to transport her physical remains back to Kansas City, where her final resting place awaited her. Um, at the same time, there was this, this other transit that was in the works. Um, it felt like a monumental shift, right? It was taking place, this transfer between records from one grandchild to another. And it felt like a generational bestowment in the form of her materials of life. Author Tia Miles addresses this type of shift a lot in her book, All That She Carried, which was an exploration into the story behind a sack passed down through generations of a Black family. She writes, quote, the sack is more than an artifact. It is an archive of its own, a collection of disparate materials and messages. It is at once a container, carrier, textile, art piece and record of past events. Shown here is what I was given, a purple padded lace photo album, the three ring binder type that uses the sticky paper of archivists nightmares, mine at least, and this plastic green file accordion file folder, which was full of ephemera that she has saved about her life, our family history, and the way that she wanted her last service to go. I was being given these records to do a job, and the job was to write Grandma Nellie's obituary and funeral program. As much as I wanted to dive in head first into these records, I knew that wasn't really an option because time was not on my side. I was back to having to work with editorial deadlines, and I had to get something written immediately. My mom wanted the obituary to run in the Kansas City Star and the Kansas City Call, which was the historic black newspaper that she grew up reading. As I began to unpack the file folder physically, I realized that it housed numerous versions of this document that was titled The Life Story of Nellie V. Raval, which if you ever met my grandmother, of course, it was called that. 
was this real? Did she already write it all down for me? Obviously, you can see here that there are various versions of something put together recounting her life. And because I've been reading her cursive my whole entire life, it was very easy to decipher. Um, what was less easy was seeing things that I had never read before and not seeing things that I knew to be true. Obviously, I had to forego my previous attempts to do a surface level review, and I ended up with everything spread out on the kitchen table. Um, Ancestry and FamilySearch.com pulled up on my computer, trying to make out these chicken scratch marks and dates on the back of photos from 1930 to piece together a timeline of her life that not only reconciled with the one that she had written out, but also with the one that I knew to be true. In the end, although I don't know if I did that, I did make my deadline. Here is the front of her funeral program uh, beside the obituary that was published in two separate weekend editions of the Kansas City Call. Trying to stay as close to her version as possible, the copy for this obituary still went through at least five versions before being sent off to the publisher. And that's five versions being sent among my mom, myself, and my aunts. The main hang up, you wonder, it resides in the first paragraph. As it reads, <clears throat> she was born in Idabel, Oklahoma in 1927, the first of four children. Now the truth is that grandma was actually the second of five. And as you can see on the blown up version of her handwritten life story, she's written it that way. But the circumstances of one sibling's short life and young death um, have been accompanied with so much pain masked as shame that the inclusion of their life in the first obituary was questioned. In the oral histories told to me by my mom, my aunts, and my grandmother, there was never a fifth child. Um, and this is the first time when her obituary was published with this story incorrect that I even heard about it. Available census records do not show a fifth child in either 1930 or 1940 when Grandma Nellie still lived at home. And despite grandma's personal inclusion of her fifth sibling in her own written life story, the decision to exclude them from her obituary was made. It resulted in the addition of them in her program and a long string of conversation about the effects of hiding things from the past to protect, protect the adults in the future. This inconsistency is just one of the many moments of omission that occurred during her end of life process. Over the next few slides, I'm going to briefly share some of her story as visualized through the memories captured in her photo album. With these memories, I will pose questions that I have been left with after doing this research. These questions are the basis of this presentation, and I encourage you to take what resonates with you into your continued interactions with the elders in your life. To start, we should start at the beginning, right? Although she didn't include this part of the genealogy in, our, in her family history, I came across this saved pamphlet uh, that I'm fairly certain she made um, for a family reunion that was held in 1992. Titled From Whence We Came, it tells the story of our ancestors, connecting them to the Chateau tribe and naming my great, great, great grandfather as a descendant of Whitehorse. Now, despite my DNA results returning no indigenous blood, this family tale is a pretty standard example of the types of narratives that black and brown families have been telling for years about our origins. And as shown in my acknowledgement slide, there is some truth to this connection between my people and the tribes in Oklahoma, but the rest is speculation. To further situate and um, position Grandma Nellie's upbringing, um, I wanted to spend some time on this slide. Right. This is a dedication uh, to the memories that she saved the most. These were the first pages in the photo album, and they show her great grandparents, George and Ann Kirk, on their farm in Idabel, Oklahoma. 
Now, this is the same farm that Grandma Nelly grew up in, grew up on um, in the 1920s and 30s. And it's the same uh, farm that was noted in the allotment papers on my um, acknowledgement slide. Looking at the handwriting, it's quite telling. The uh, larger cursive handwriting on the back of the top image is definitely Grandma Nelly's, which leads me to believe that the made in 1931 on the top image and these pictures was made by Anna in 1931 on the bottom picture was written by her great grandmother, Anne. Seeing George and Anne on what I assume was their farm, the same land that Grandma Nellie's life started on is surreal. <clears throat> Growing up in Oklahoma, her family moved to Oklahoma City where she graduated high school in the 1940s. Um, leading up to this graduation photo, these are the only pictures that we have as Grandma Nelly, of Grandma Nellie as a young woman. And seeing how she took such meticulous notes of place and time on some other photos, but didn't write anything on ones like these, it left me speculating where she was and who she was when she took those photos. Who gave her those photos and why didn't she document them? <clears throat> Another omission present in her life story and ultimately in her obituary comes from a time in her life that I knew nothing about. While reading her handwritten life story, I learned for the first time that between 1944 and 1947, Grandma Nelly lived in Tacoma, Washington, where she got a job working on Todd's shipyard. Not only was it fascinating to learn that grandma's sense of independence has always been present, but seeing her inclusion of this part of her life took me by surprise because I had never heard her talk about it before. Todd's shipyard is a historic landmark today, recognized for its part in creating wartime economy, integrating the workforce, and putting women to work before uh, during a time when that was pretty unheard of. Because of this, photos and manuscripts um, from women workers are a relevant piece of archival history. On the bottom right is a photo from Todd's shipyard during the time that Grandma Nellie could have been there. Peeking at the photo and seeing scattered black faces, you can only imagine where my mind has gone. Could Grandma be back there? Maybe she was around the corner. I took this query, I guess you would say, a step further when investigating what the community was like in at the time that she lived there. I was unable to find her in any census reports, but another thing caught my eye, which is documented in the top photo. This is a photo of USO number two, a, an all black club in Tacoma, Washington, near the shipyards, where jazz musicians would light up the night and um, as you can see, that looks like they were doing it right. I started to wonder, did grandma ever stop in for a dance, a cocktail, friendly conversation? I know that it is trivial work to scan photos for similarities in the face, but I can't help but start looking for her. Now, without giving away too much because I would like to sleep tonight without her ghost lingering beside my bed, some parts of my grandmother's life that she omitted from her self-told life story are easily found in available records. Using nor known sources for genealogy gold, including census and marriage records, populated Grandma Nellie over her life in both Oklahoma and Missouri as she became the strong matriarch of our family that I knew and loved. She was married three times, but chose to only include one in her autobiographical account. Here is a photo of my grandmother with her late husband, Nathaniel Russell Raval, and my aunt Natalie in her home in Kansas City, Missouri. Originally, my speculations about why she left her previous marriages out surrounded the condition she may have experienced. I later found out that she lied about her age for one, which could have been a contributing factor in her hiding it. Now, I've taken some time and separated myself from her death. And it's allowed me to see that her omission of her multiple marriages moved this, what would have been a male dominated narrative and centered her story on her, which is quite frankly, much more badass than anything else. 
a look at Black feminist standpoint epistemology a la Patricia Hill Collins, and it would stand to say that when we center the experiences of Black women, we open the doors to questions and answers about more than just the lives of those Black women. And in asking these questions of the Black women in my life, I was merely attempting to find intersections that had previously been ignored. My exploration into grandma's lived experiences factors into the development of my personal self definition, and it can be asserted that the research I've done opens the realm of questions and possibilities that I have about the authenticity of her documented experience. Maria Tambuku wrote about the intra actions between space time matter relations and the forces experienced by archival workers when dealing with the documents of life. Now, as someone who straddles the line between archival worker and family historian, those intra actions are so much more deeply rooted for me. The granddaughter in me wants to remind the archivist in me that just because it was recorded doesn't mean it needs to be retold. The story someone else wanted to tell of their life should be allowed to exist at the same time as it is being questioned, especially when it comes to physical items. Questioning the remnants is an honest way to engage with them. And this experience has showed me that. The creativity and intentionality displayed by my grandmother as represented by the physical materials she collected of her life come together to tell another story. Both Alice Walker and Tia Miles, among others, have named the value in exploring the physical items created by Black women of the past, noting that they often, as Miles puts it, quote, become these emotional nets that affirm their love for self and others. And I can attest to that as I feel a surge of my ancestors every time I open both the file folder and the photo album. I can now stand back from it all and ask myself, were Grandma Nellie's attempts to control the image left behind rooted in dismantling the stereotypes of Black women that she faced her entire life? Was this her one chance to have control over the knowledge about her life? Was she asserting agency and doing what was necessary to survive? Again, I'm left to speculate because she is no longer here, but knowing who she was, the answer is probably yes. Lastly, I would just like to say thanks to Grandma for allowing me to voice her story in this way and to you all for being here with me today. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was really moving and powerful. I really appreciated the presentation. Um, thank you so much for sharing that story. We turn now to our final presentation, um, and I'd like to introduce Thomas Lannan, who is the Director of Special Collections and Archives at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania. Previously, he served as Assistant Director of Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books at the New York Public Library and has been involved in many facets of acquisition, description, and public service for special collections materials. Thomas's talk is entitled More Than Missing Items, Unsolved Cases in Institutional Histories. So Thomas, whenever you're ready. Okay, can you hear me? And yes. I'm gonna share my screen. Is that coming through in full and my sound is good? Okay. Yes, I can see. Uh, thanks to everyone and thanks to Lauren and Laura for your presentations and thanks to um, colleagues here at, at the Clark Library UCLA and Oakland University for this um, awesome conference and this sort of chance to come together to discuss difficult subjects. Um, so basically my, I, um, my paper today is an attempt at a case study uh, and is directly influenced by ongoing work in the field of archives and archival theory. Uh, in their article, From Human Rights to Feminist Ethics, Radical Empathy in the Archives, Michelle Caswell and Maraca C4 uh, state that much work needs to be done to further conceptualize how feminist ethics may cause us, cause us to rethink archival roles 
deeper interrogation is needed to unpack this notion of radical empathy and to examine archival relationships in ways that do not erase differences about and between bodies. They go on to say multiple case studies are needed to explore how an archival ethics of care has been or can be enacted in real world environments. So I approached um, this particular story uh, of loss uh, that I encountered in my position here at, at Lafayette College, and I, and I wondered how uh, a, an ethics of care and a deeper empathy could provide a framework for me to process the information I had learned uh, to set up a way forward. The, the presentation is an extension of my trying to use care in a relational approach to a particularly challenging issue confronted in a set of records. Uh, from the perspective of a case study, I want to also explore and understand the benefits and limits of a, of a feminist ethics that understands situated knowledge and archival relations um, and, and con context-bound approach toward morality and decision-making. Moral, social, and political feminist, philo feminist philosophers who have advanced an ethics of care do still allow for room for traditional and dominant moral theories, especially when these are seen embedded within a wider network of relations between human beings. For example, Virginia Held states, the deontological and consequentialist approaches of Kantian ethics and utilitarianism, for instance, may still be appropriate for many issues within the realm of the legal and political. Anyway, these are really complicated issues. But my case study here is intended to determine how care ethics uh, differs from a consequentialist approach and how these differences may be used to help archival practitioners when facing loss in repositories. Um, another undercurrent in my personal experience as a library and worker has been the power of storytelling. Storytelling and prof the professional, professional identity of librarians and archivists was the focus of a rare book and manuscript section uh, annual meeting a few years ago of, of the American Library Association where storytelling was described as including narrative, representation, and memory, all important elements of library and cultural heritage work. Um, librarians and archivists often serve as storytellers. They have deep contextual knowledge about an item or a set of records and are often called to demonstrate their value through teaching and talking to constituencies about those materials. Um, in a sense, storytelling is a performance where enthusiasm and personal charisma are currency. Storytelling is therefore a mode of performing that results in relationship building. However, storytelling has its own ethical limits. A telling of a story to manipulate and to deceive the public is unethical. And um, however, when stories are told for good ends, such as uh, towards a social justice, do those good ends justify the fact that a story may be untrue or possibly incomplete? So. Um, basically, my before I go into this sort of story, I just want to say I'm, I'm going to be talking um, about a series of events that include loss in its gravest form. Uh, so this is a warning that this story includes sort of what I would deem genuine sadness, failure, and a still unsolved mystery of a tragic loss of life. I was not aware of this story before I arrived at my current position, and, and I discovered it while I was uh, sort of reviewing internal files regarding security and past practices. It's not something I wanted to learn about. The story is not something I sought out, but the records were there and also not there and remain a part of the archive despite time moving forward. Um, so uh, in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, there's found Egypt, an Egyptian pectoral. Its medium is gold and silver with inlays of carnelian and glass. Uh, it's about 15 inches by five inches. Such pectorals of ancient Egypt were a form of jewelry and something similar to a brooch that were worn by people of means and by the pharaoh. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts describes this pectoral as sumptuous and fit for a king and takes the form of a vulture with outstretched wings representing the guardian goddess of Upper Egypt grasping coils of rope, a symbol of eternity. To the left of the vulture's body is a rearing cobra the goddess of Lower Egypt, together they form a pair referred to as the two ladies, guardian deities of the king. The imagery suggests this pectoral was made as a piece of funer funerary equipment rather than as jewelry to be worn in life. Uh, museum and special collections and archives with collections developed in the 19th century may have material related to or directly from Egypt. This is due to the upswing of popularity of Egyptian history during this time and the, the then lax controls of its antiquarian trade. Uh, in Ancient Corpses as Curiosities, Mummy Mania in the eight, Early Age of Travel, anthropologist Tessa Baber describes this period when Egyptomania had swept the Western world and travelers and travelers and tourists ventured to Egypt to indulge their interest in the land of the Nile. Victorian Mummy Mania was a time when archaeologists and historians of Egypt were able to travel the country and take advantage of a political instability and walk away with pieces of history. 
Um, and in fact, uh, in 1858, someone named George A. Stone Esquire traveled to Egypt and is said to have acquired a papyrus found on the body of a mummy in one of the rock tombs at Thebes. Along with the papyrus, Stone acquired a gold spread eagle, a tablet, and a, 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 a scarabacus, um, and from which he paid the, for which he paid the equivalent of around 90 pounds sterling. Stone's discoveries were reported by Gustavus Seyfarth in the Transactions of the Academy of St. Louis in 1860, and sometime between 1860 and 1873, the papyrus, pectoral, and tablet were purchased by John Work Garrett, president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and in 1838, a graduate of Lafayette College, and in 1873, Garrett gifted these items to his alma mater. Um, much attention was given to the Egyptian artifacts. A papyrus was exhibited by the college's president, William C. Cattell, at an annual meeting of the American Philological Society. Uh, in 1876, Scribner's Magazine featured the college in an article that documented the ownership of the papyrus. And after 1876, the papyrus hung above the entrance to the college library, um, where it was housed until the early 20th century. Uh, and then moved into this 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 library called the Van Wickle Library, and where it was displayed for for many years in the reading room. Uh, parts of this sort of this gift. So media studies, uh, Shannon, media studies professor Shannon Matern writes in the article "Library as Infrastructure" that libraries materialize at multiple scales, from the design of their web interfaces and furnishings to the architecture of their buildings and the networking of their technical infrastructures, their underlying bureaucratic and epistemic structures. Um, th therefore, it is true that as a library's architecture changes, so too does the knowledge preserved therein, and special collections are often directly linked to physical spaces that their parent institutions are able to construct and manage for their library's rare and unique material. A library or an archival collection is often inextricably linked to its physical storage or the location where it was created and is managed. In 1964, Skillman Library at Lafayette College was a brand new building. Um, the Egyptian items were no longer on display, but had been removed to a locked staff area and placed in a vault. Rather than a symbol of learning, the items were treated for their potential financial value and locked out of sight. Presumably, the pectoral was therefore safe. However, as Kate Timer in her essay, A Thief in Our Midst, Special Collections, Archives, and Insider, Insider Theft uh, details, a shocking amount of thefts do arrive by insiders or employees of libraries and archives. Uh, in 1983, a librarian named Bob Jeanette was removed from his position at Lafayette College for reportedly stealing thousands of dollars out of the library's copy machines. So, uh, so why was the Lafayette Pectoral purchased by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts? Um, basically, what, it, it's, a, it's a complicated story that involves the auction market in New York City and dealers who appraised the item and left no record behind. Uh, in fact, what is known about the breastplate comes from internal investigations that ultimately led to the title transfer from Lafayette College to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in 1992, a decision reached through agreement between two institutions when the story uh, after the story uh, um, of the MFA purchase was finally shared and made public. Uh, the, the item traveled to New York City from a Pennsylvania antiques dealer, uh, and the dealer told, sub, told the antiques, sorry, the, um, the dealer took the piece to Sotheby's to have it appraised. Uh, Sotheby's accepted the invented provenance uh, of, from the Pennsylvania antiques dealer that the item and the item was taken to London where it was repaired. For the Sotheby's catalog, the Egyptian artifact was compared to gold collars of Tutankhamun and the shrine pectoral of Ramses II. It was up for auction with an estimate of $300,000 in 1980, the equivalent in purchasing power to a million dollars in 2022. However, the pectoral received only one bid below its reserve price for $110,000. And after the auction, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts remained interested and worked out a private sale. Despite the sale, Lafayette College did not know, did not report the item missing, presumably because in the days before the internet, the only way to know what was at auction in New York City was via auction catalogs, and the college was not in the antiquities market and did not know about this sale. It also did not know about this sale because the card file that reported or recorded the, uh, the items had been tampered with and were removed. So it was difficult for the museum and special collections professionals at Lafayette to know about the missing item because in addition to its being stolen, the card files removing the item had also been removed. Presumably, this was evidence of the theft being an inside job. However, the evidence was, itself was missing. So wh whoever managed the card files also potentially knew about the pectoral. 
The cataloging librarian knew about the existence of the Egyptian pectoral as part of the, the inventory of the special collections vault, but with internal records missing, it was difficult to prove any theft. On March 24, 1984, nearly two months before her retirement, librarian Alice C. Hall body was discovered in her Palmer Township residence near Easton, PA. She was the victim of a murder that remains unsolved today. It was also the first murder to occur in Palmer Township, PA in 28 years, a fact which uh, made the police department there particularly poorly equipped to handle, uh, to, uh, including collecting evidence and following proper investigation, te investigation techniques. Uh, eventually, the FBI were brought in only to discover issues with the investigation and that the crime scene had been corrupted and evidence possibly po improperly collected. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the details of Hall's murder, nor am I particularly interested in the case. It was a tragic event and senseless and horrible. I can say that the murder remains unsolved for reasons which I can only speculate about, but true crime is not my interest here. I do not want to connect the murder and loss of life to a time. I sorry, I do want to connect the murder and loss of life to a timeline that shows that the murder may relate to the missing breastplate. Um, in 1993, Jeanette, uh, a former assistant, the former assistant librarian who was fired in the early 1980s, admitted in court documents that he had that he had stole the Egyptian breastplate that was the focus of litigation between the college and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts uh, in a legal memo to the uh, before the Northampton County District Attorney's Office. Jeanette conceded this item was unlawfully converted sometime in the late 1970s. Um, the timeline makes this issue all more tragic. Because the breastplate was not declared missing, Jeanette could not be charged in that crime. Because he was not charged in the crime of the stolen breastplate, it could not be used as evidence in the investigation of Alice Hall's murder. Ulti ultimately, the archives do not include the full records of this trial, uh, including hundreds of pages of depositions, which are presumably in the district attorney's office and in the county archives related to this unsolved murder. Uh, I wonder, should a person in my role, this is a, sort of one of my questions, should a person in my role be more compelled to find these depositions and add them to the archives uh, regarding this unsolved murder, or do they belong with the state uh, out of a consequential model that hopefully leads to the murder solution? But by not having access to these records, am I severing relations with a record creator in a community? Um, if we think this is a separate issue from collection management, it's it's um, it's further exacerbated by the fact that in 1995, Alice Hall's sister, Elizabeth H. Noble, presented a 600 page typescript unpublished novel written by her sister, Alice, that remains an item in the collection, uh, a sort of macabre memento of a slain colleague. Um, so that's the sort of story that, I, that 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 I'm that I'm dealing with and looking looking to process. Um, so, and I now want to talk about, um, I guess I don't have that much time, but I want to talk briefly about hair work on archives, uh, noting that there has been an intellectual progress in archival theory towards uh, towards a, a sort of care, uh, ethics of care. Um, however, the concept of care is, so the, the concept of care is vital to advancing work in archives and libraries. And it is because I care about the concept that I wanted to explore how an archival ethics could be enacted in this real world environment. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, to do was to read more, and I, ideally, one of the things I find I find is that that there's a lot of literature on care-based ethics, and archives and information professionals should include a broader range of theorists into dialogue. However, it can be daunting to do interdisciplinary work that incorporates re that incorporates research from two or more fields, let alone field of ethics, which can be difficult, which can be a difficult literature to consume. Um, we should know that the foundations of care ethics. Uh, in part, has been based on the rejection of objective or universal claims and establishing a single morality for all. Care focuses on relationships, not categories, and our abstract modes of justice. Care is central to the 20th century continental philosophy's challenge uh, to a progress in enlightenment and modernity. In Martin Heidegger's opus, Being in Time, the book is structured around an argument that shows how care is prior to reason. Uh, in being in time, the existential definition of human beings or existence culminates with the idea that care is primary to reason in providing meaning. While I'm not able to discuss the challenges of Heidegger's philosophy, it is fair to say that his influence is in the background of many postmodern critiques of rationality. Uh, care has also been present in libraries and museums for years in the position of curators, which comes from the word the Latin word cura, meaning to take care uh, as a manager or overseer. And there are other important examples of care, which we may, we may find inspiration from. 
uh, the, the Roman goddess Cura uh, is uh, part of this, this old story of the fable of care. Uh, and it has to do with the creation of human beings. The Roman goddess Cura gathered clay and began to shape it in her image. She asked Jupiter to give it spirit, and he did. When she wanted her name to bestowed upon it, Jupiter argued that it be named for him. While they argued, Earth arose and desired that the name, her name be given to the being, since she had offered it part of her body. The three asked Saturn to serve as judge, who gave them the decision. Since you, Jupiter, have given it its spirit, you should receive that spirit at death. And since Earth have given its body, you shall receive its body at death. But since care first shaped this creature, she shall possess it as long as it lives. And because there is a dispute among you as to its name, let it be called Homo, for it is made of hum out of hummus or earth or hummus. Um, in this uh, allegory about, about the creation of human humanity, care is shown to have shaped it in its image. And here we can see how care in this ancient fable is essential to our humanity. Um, Cura is also cited in the moral epistles of Seneca, uh, ultimately saying that the, the human being is fulfilled by cura, alterius cura hominis. Um, care is therefore not a new concept, but has long been central to the idea of a moral being and as a being determined by care uh, within centuries of thought. Uh, the work of the philosopher and literary critic Julia Kristeva relies on this anthropogeny of care, or cura, and uses the fable as an allegory for the cultural distinction between health, defined as a definitive state, and healing as a derivative process. Kristeva's work is directed at the medical humanities and seeks to question the conventional distinction between the objectivity of science and the subjectivity of culture. How can archivists likewise use the fable of cura not only to restore relationships, but to reinvent their work as a reparative process where memory is part of the path of healing, where archives and collections are not simply in service to questions about objectivity, where primary sources define historical events, but our work is one part of a relationship of communities, learning, thinking, and caring. It seems like where the field is moving, uh, though it is linked and, uh, to a sort of humanistic tradition. Um, I... I, we're at time, I, 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 and I, I might, I'm going to run out of time, but I was quickly, um, I have a model here where it, which basically shows that the, um, this, this is where we're at, I think, as a profession, that we have, we sort of admit that archivists or librarians at the center of relationships between users, creators, um, and sort of communities and records subjects. But I, I've wanted to incorporate the work of um, Joan Tronto, who is a sort of under, under, whose work, Moral Boundaries, a Political Argument for an Ethic of Care, uh, offers a definition of care as a spe species of activity that includes everything we do to maintain, contain, maintain, contain, and repair our world. Um, for Toronto, the association of care with women is, em is empirically and historically inaccurate, and she presents care as one of the central activities of human life and illustrates the way society degrades the import importance of care in order to maintain the power of those who are privileged. Uh, and looking at um, Tronto's definition, she posits care as a practice, not a theory, uh, and further identifies four elements of a reci reciprocal care that could be understood simultaneously as stages or goals. These include attentiveness or caring about responsibility or caring for responsiveness or care receiving and competence for caregiving. I believe Tronto's model would be a valuable, valuable addition to understanding a, a care ethics and archives and that we could benefit from considering all facets of our work and practice through this lens or framework. Um, furthermore, it would be exciting to see conversations about competence and responsibility in connection with collection stewardship and ex explicated in terms of an ethics of care. For example, our staff trained sufficiently and supported through professional development. This should be framed around conversations of competence, which requires attention by managers and staff. Likewise, what would a relational definition of care for security look like? Rather than simply seeing security as the measures taken to guard against, we should see care and security. Security literally means free from care or without care or anxiety. Um, our collection security measures should look at our anxiety about collections and include actions that provide relief for anxiety. Another uh, direction for a care-based ethics, in, um, uh, so, uh, sorry, um, if we see security lessons guarding us, um, security should allow staff to be untroubled. If we further brought in a focus on competence and responsibility, our security should not be overseen by a single staff person, but shared in a relationship across our libraries. 
to aid security of our collections, uh, professionals need to maintain up-to-date records of unlocated items, noting their status as, as missing, and use catalog records to describe copy-specific characteristics and bibliographic information that helps to distinguish them. Add information about the missing stolen materials, including the pectoral, been stored in multiple locations to ease the concern of a single staff member, a librarian's life would not have been threatened. Today, we should look at repositories and our standards of security to make sure that secrets and collections are not held by single individuals, that knowledge about missing items and, uh, and, and our collections is distributed and shared. Um, I'll end it there because I think I'm at time, but so thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. That was so that was super interesting. I really um, enjoyed hearing about that case study. Um, this it's our Q and A time now, and we do have a few questions already. Um, and um, I I have a few of my own too. Um, I I wanted to ask about. It seems like at least in the last two presentations. Um, you both discovered something in your research or in the course of um, your daily activities um, that was that was either traumatic or, or unexpected or something that maybe the person wouldn't want out there. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what whether to tell somebody's story or leave it unspoken or how can archivists or other information professionals balance the need to maintain the, the privacy of individuals implicated in missing collection items um, while also acknowledging and honoring their presence in the, in the record? Um, yeah, I can just briefly say, you know, it's been and still is a constant question of how to represent someone else and because it is something that was um and still is so personal and real for me it felt it, it it's still like i don't know i don't know how to do it i feel like i tried to approach it in the way that i think she would be proud of while also recognizing that um I'm just the medium to tell the story. I'm not the the, the teller, um, even though I am. So um, I don't know. I guess that doesn't really answer the question because I don't know if I have one. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 just hard. <laughs> it's um, I guess we're all just figuring this kind of thing out. Uh, Thomas, do you have any comments on that? No, it's a good question. I I don't know. I mean, am I by telling the story of Alice Hall in this setting, am I sort of doing the right thing or does it deserve to be private? I don't and it, it isn't private because it's like you you, it, you you can Google it. The some of the strange things is, is that I think other people have been interested in the story. And at some point, like a New York Times reporter may have had a, a book deal potentially to write about it, but it didn't happen. So there's just so much. I, I don't know the sort of full history of all this. That it, um, it and I'm, I don't really want to benefit from it. I, I instead want to sort of use it to sort of talk about how we should improve our security practices and not put staff at risk by being having only some people know about things to show that that's actually a gen, like the, that our lives are at risk and uh, and to sort of put into practice the idea that it's not collections that we're in the service for it's it's staff and so this we need to think about that. But but I, and so that's a good use to put the story her story. But I don't think I'm really telling her story by doing that. And I don't, I, and that, I don't know how to answer the question. Right. Um, um, there's a question for Lauren. Um, um, as a family historian, th this is who wrote the question. <laughs> as a family historian descended from people who told very creative and selectively redacted versions of their lives. And as an archivist who thinks a lot about archival silences, I will be thinking about your talk for a while. Have you found that your personal experience doing this family history work has had any impact in how you you work as an archivist? And um, conversely, do you feel like your professional work has impacted your approach to family history work? Mm. Uh, yeah, yes to both. I think um, I'm much more likely to investigate a potential story um, that I feel could be hiding in someone else's 
um, documentation of life. And so I, it may make me more of a dreamer in that sense where I can go down a rabbit hole of imagining the life of someone else um, only because I know now that on the surface, someone's life story is just one part of their actual life. And so I, I end up like filling in the space with extra. Um, I also will say in terms of the second part of the question, I believe is about like how it changes my archival skills, correct? Um, I'm a little more protective of the physical now, I think for sure, which is funny because I'm the digital archivist. So I'm um, <laughs> working primarily with born digital content, but even in that regard, um, with some of the born digital examples of records, I am a little bit more likely to be protective over their um, well-being, not for the not just because it's there, but because I, I know that it, it has that sentimentality associated with it. Um, so yes, it's affected my, my work a lot. Yeah, I totally understand as, a, as another digital librarian um, and feeling that way about, about physical materials. Um, I wanted to ask everybody, or not me, somebody else, <laughs> about um, to maybe elaborate a bit on your opinions about the role of metadata in filling missing info um, and the historical narrative. What is the implication of not having the full story when trying to put together the history of a collection? And um, do you have any suggestions of how we can work together to fill the gaps? They, they give an example. Um, we don't have um, um, the personal papers of some of, of, of um, a figure. And um, so a lot of the knowledge of his life is missing or was just wrong until they did um, research, but the damage to his re reputation was accidentally repeated to them for a long time until they learned more. Um, so so the question is basically about, um, yeah, metadata and, and how you think about that when filling in missing info about a historical narrative. I mean, I, who, who's answer, who's that for? I, I'm I'm a big fan of metadata, um, and I think that there's a lot of challenges there. The, the and we'd have to talk about the sort of turn in the last decade or so about of um in archives archival practice to sort of accession things and make them available and and not do item level rec not do item not create item level records. That's that that has been a that that's. I mean, I think we all have experienced that maybe in our own careers, the benefits and negatives of, of that, but that's an important sort of moment that we do have archives that are in collections that do not have item level material. So we're, and if, and then that means that we don't have security in place for some of those materials um, because we don't have full records for them. Uh, and that's a real challenge, but at the same time, you don't want to imp impede access to create item level record for or item level metadata you want people to see it and experience it and touch the archive as it was created not and, and not only through a, me, a mediation of like an item by item thing so this it's a, it is a real tension um it, right, right now absolutely laura or lauren do you have any thoughts um, I think for me it's a it's slightly different because the specific collection that I obviously presented about is not one that is housed in a library or archive it's housed in my house so um, I. I think when thinking about it in the context of archival work I I would like to err on the side of collection level because. Um, of a very a variety of reasons, but one of which being that although I want people to engage with the physical archives themselves, I am now so much more hesitant to make them um, item level available because what they hold may not be describable at an item level in the way that fully represents the entirety of the item, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. I don't want to limit its um, weight by 
and maybe maybe that's just not relevant because again this is like my collection and not a collection in a library but i would i would hesitate to do it on an item level i would stick to um the collection because it's just too big <laughs> to break down yeah um laura i was i was wondering do you what what how do you feel about that when when you're trying to um represent basically the history of a particular item that's gone through this um this sort of fraught history um where it's it's been in a lot of places and it, it might have even re it's returned back to where it first came from what what how have you thought about representing that in in the record or um using metadata to do that yeah so i'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective in that i'm right. primarily an academic and then i have moved into library cataloging um and uh has it it's been kind of serendipitous in that research project that i'm now working on that collection to catalog it um i think the there's been i don't know what it's like in the us but in the uk the history of provenance recording is patchy um and um even if it's kind of known it's not necessarily actually put into an item record um so a lot of what i was doing on my fellowship last year was provenance research and trying to trace books back through different owners and make that more available to people to help them understand how collections fit together um and i think also the part of the difficulty is not knowing where those gaps sometimes exist um so um because of a kind of sometimes it can be something as simple as the book was purchased by a um a book collector or a book seller for a private collector who didn't want to be known so at that point that book kind of disappears from the record and we don't know where it goes um and i think that also becomes complicated in the situations that i'm looking at because i'm looking very much at a less of a personal collection and more of a kind of like a family collection or um, the property is like an institution almost um, that has been collected into by lots of different people and there's the particular situation also that in most of these houses they are also funded and were built using money which was from um, imperial and colonial um, possessions so Blathwaite is a classic example and so with the distribution of his papers um, it's not just important in terms of thinking about the collection as a whole, but it also means that if those papers go into private ownership, we lose that section of history to understand those colonial, like the colonial implications of a man like William Blathwaite. Um, so I think when things do come back, it is really important to try and use that metadata to trace that history and make that history really obvious um the uk is and the national trust especially is doing a lot of work on kind of tracing back those colonial histories to our objects because they kind of fill all of the trust houses um so i think that's also a really important part of reckoning with how these objects came to be collected in the first place um and how they those collections were maintained and, and built and how they benefited certain people um yeah i don't I, I don't know basically metadata good um finding the information to actually create that metadata a little bit more difficult on my end right thank you yeah yeah i i used to work um in art museums for a long time and so we had this um specific way of representing the provenance of of the object um, and I, I'm not as familiar with how it works with um, rare books. Um, so um, thanks for commenting on that. Um, so we have a question from an interesting question from YouTube. Um, uh, do you think that the role, this is for everybody or anyone who wants to comment. Um, do you think that the role of an archivist or librarian is like a backwards investigation, as in trying to find the mystery or enigma of a narrative? when the information or evidence is already present? Yeah, 100%. I, um, I like 
to <laughs> consume true crime and mm -hmm. I like to consume it in the in the sense that I also um think that everything is a puzzle that I need to solve. And that's not necessarily an archivist job, but I definitely enjoy the investigation aspect of trying to tell the story from uh, the puzzle pieces that we can find. Yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like I sort of was drawn to the career because of the investigation aspect of it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I'm coming from the historian perspective slightly, um, but my PhD work is um, on the lives of um, patients in lunatic asylums in the 19th century. And so much of that is working with what isn't there um, because institutional uh, records are really um, numerous and extensive, but like, taking like the trace like finding traces and trying to work back through the traces um to try and get an understanding of what an actual person's experience was and I'm still also reckoning with the personally with the whole how to tell someone's story in a respectful way um how, how to kind of uh deal with the fact that these people were not didn't have no in what no way consented to have their stories told and um I I've tied myself up in knots about dealing with that but that even if those stories aren't something that I tell publicly I'm still I get so attached to understanding how people's lives have come together and 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 how like the objects that they leave behind or the papers that they leave behind have um might represent that experience and that story um yeah, that's 100% the appeal for me. Um, but I think it's something that uh, there's a lot of responsibility associated with it. Absolutely. Yeah, Th Thomas, um, I, you, you, you mentioned storytelling a little bit in, in your presentation. Do you have anything to add? Um, I, I think storytelling is, is, again, I think it's a type of performance and I think we should approach it like skeptically and, and do it, learn, know how to do it, but, and, and as, but, but it's, but sometimes it's impossible to do, uh, you know, the if you're if you have a set of records that you're describing as an archivist, your your job is not to explain them, uh, it, it, but to make them accessible. And right. so the the description can't solve all of the possible mysteries and all the research questions. You you need to allow other people to do that. So um, so I think that our stores. And I would say there's different types of storytelling. There's sort of curatorial storytelling, which could be more performance-based and, and sort of fantastic and fabulous. And then there's archival story or archive storytelling, which is more like impossible and infinite. And 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 like and it's not. It's like it's everywhere. It's hidden in plain sight. You know, the, the, there's all this, these fascinating stories. Um, so I think storytelling is maybe like a muscle we have to learn how to you know work out all the different different you know work on as professionals. Awesome. Thank you. I think that's a really good note to end on. Um, thank you so much to everyone um, who presented in this panel. It was really wonderful. Um, we are going to take a little bit of a break and come back in 20 minutes at 1120 a.m. PSD. And um, that would be two. No, not 1120, 1140 <laughs> and then 240 p.m. Um, Eastern. So thank you so much to all of the panelists. That was fantastic. Thank and I'll you. see you in a little bit. Thank you.